வணக்கம் வாட் இன்வெஸ்டிகேஷன்ஸ் கேன் பி டூ ஃபார் அ சைல்டு அஃபெக்டட் பை அ பர்த் பிரேக்கியல் பிளெக்சஸ் பாலிசி ஆர் தி எலக்ட்ரோ டயக்னோஸ்டிக் டெஸ்ட்ஸ் லைக் தி நர்வ் கண்டக்ஷன் ஸ்டடீஸ் அண்ட் இஎம்ஜி பாசிபிள் இன் சில்ட்ரன் ஆர் தே டிஃப்ரெண்ட் ஃப்ரம் தோஸ் தட் வி டூ இன் அடல்ட்ஸ் அண்ட் ஹவு டு தே ஹெல்ப் அஸ் இன் கன்ஃபார்மிங் அவர் டயக்னோசிஸ் ஆர் ஹவு டு தே ஆட் டு தி டயக்னோசிஸ் தட் வி ஹேவ் மேட் of birth brachial plexus palsy all this and more in this video basically the investigations that can be done for an infant or a child with birth brachial plexus palsy can be broadly divided into imaging studies and electrodiagnostic studies in the previous video we have dealt with the imaging studies and in this video we shall be talking about the electrodiagnostic studies that are useful in birth brachial plexus palsy lesions the following play a role in electrodiagnostic studies electromyography or emg nerve conduction studies or ncs which consist of sensory nerve action potentials and the compound motor action potentials or the c maps spinal evoked potentials and the somatosensory evoked potentials but these last two investigations are rarely done in infants and children i have already dealt with the basics of electromyography and nerve conduction studies in a previous video and you can click on the icon above to access that video in this presentation we shall be talking about the role of these electro diagnostic studies in birth brachial plexus palsy and hence in infants and children a well done electro diagnostic test series will tell us about the status of each root commenting on whether it is a pre or post ganglionic injury it will also tell us about the status of reinnervation and the progress if any we can also come to know the status of important individual muscles the compound motor action potentials of recipient and donor nerves in cases involving distal nerve transfers can also be found for example flexor carpi ulnaris and flexor carpi radialis cmap bilaterally can be done to determine if the donor fascicle is good enough for an oberlohn type repair electro diagnostic tests will document co contractions and they are especially useful if botox injections or muscle transfer is being considered to perform the electromyographic studies in children a pediatric emg needle is preferred emg evaluation of the muscle is done at rest and during voluntary movement this may not be exact in children because they may not be doing the voluntary movements if the nerve is involved at rest the muscle will show signs of abnormal spontaneous activity that is signs of denervation or denervation potentials and the classical signs are fibrillation potentials and positive sharp waves after this denervation some of the muscles get a reinnervation as we have seen in a previous video this reinnervation may be one of the two types it could be a reinnervation by collateral sprouting from the surviving axons in which changes in morphology include polyphasia large amplitude muscle unit action potentials or increased duration potentials on emg such findings will indicate reinnervation by collateral sprouting whereas when there is evidence of axon regrowth it is suggested by the presence of nascent units which are small in amplitude and highly polyphasic and have a prolonged duration the emg in babies with birth brachial plexus palsy differs from adults in that the denervation occurs and disappears much earlier it can be found already on the fourth day and may have disappeared at four months this denervation occurs in adults only by two weeks it has been found that this denervation process is about 7.5 to 10 times faster in infants it is believed that this could be due to the short distances that are involved and the smaller diameters of the nerves that are damaged the other unique emg finding in babies affected by birth brachial plexus palsy is that we may find near normal recordings on the affected muscles even if the infant has had a severe lesion 
or even a root avulsion. There are three proposed hypothetical reasons for this phenomena. The first reason is that because the muscle fibers and the corresponding motor units are 11 fold smaller in infants than in adults, the number of active motor units in infants is easily overestimated if the same size EMG needle is used for both adults and infants. The second proposed reason is the plasticity of the infantile nervous system. A particular study documented innervation of the deltoid and biceps from the C7 in the presence of avulsions of C5 and C6 roots. This will give an appearance of good EMGs from the deltoid and biceps giving hope regarding prognosis. The third hypothetical reason is the concept of luxury innervation. At birth, there may still be a polyneural innervation in which nerves from multiple segments supply extra innervation to muscles. This pattern is reported to disappear and be replaced by mononeural innervation from week 16 to 25 of gestation and this may extend up to 3 months of age. In the absence of the original dominant innervation as in root avulsions, this pattern probably persists explaining the overly optimistic near normal EMG findings. But we need to remember that in these innervations, the central motor pathways do not primarily project to the anterior horn cells of these luxury nerves. This could be one of the reasons for co-contractions which are documented in infants and neonates. It has been found that there is a high occurrence of respiratory synkinesis almost in 45%. This is seen in this child whose right limb has been affected by birth brachial plexus palsy and the movements are occurring coordinated with the respiratory movements. There is one question that arises now. If there is so much of extra innervation coming in, why is there still a paresis of the muscles in birth brachial plexus palsy? That is because the innervation that occurs is incomplete, there is no central connectivity and other muscles are also contracting at the same time. So to evaluate the electrical activity in the muscles, EMG alone is not enough. We need to consider the nerve conduction studies also. The principles of performing nerve conduction studies in the infant and young child are similar to that for the adult patient with appropriate modifications. Usually it is helpful to have the parent or parents present during the study to comfort the child. The pediatric stimulator is preferred because of the shorter distance between the anode and the cathode. Pediatric sized ring electrodes work well as a reference recording electrode. We need to begin with the median and ulnar motor studies because they are usually easier to obtain than sensory responses and the stimulus required is smaller. Sensory responses can be difficult to obtain because of the technical difficulties associated with an infant's small and short digits. The nerve conduction studies that we will be concentrating on are the sensory nerve action potentials and the compound motor action potentials. As far as the sensory nerve conduction values in the infant are concerned, the velocity is about half of that in the normal adult. By one year, they reach about 75% of adult values. Similarly, Sensory amplitudes of newborns are somewhat lower than adult values and by 6 months to 1 year, adult values are attained. The next point to remember is the difference in the sensory nerve action potentials recording in avulsion of the brachial plexus and rupture of the nerves in birth brachial plexus palsy. When there is an avulsion, it is a preganglionic lesion and though the dorsal nerve root has avulsed, the cell body is still intact and maintains its continuity with the sensory nerve. So in this lesion, though there is no sensation and there is a motor paralysis on the involved upper limb, the sensory nerve action potentials will be recorded because of the continuity of the cell body and the sensory nerve. But in a case of a rupture of the nerve, which is known as a postganglionic lesion, again there is no sensation and there is a motor paralysis of the entire involved upper limb. But since the continuity of the cell body and the sensory nerve is lost, there will be no recording of sensory nerve action potentials. Here it is important to correlate between EMG findings and nerve conduction study findings. This is because 
nerve conduction block and avulsion injuries can be differentiated by just this single analysis. When there is an involvement of the upper limb in birth brachial plexus palsy and sensory nerve action potentials are recorded, it could be either a conduction block or an avulsion injury. Now we need to look at the denervation potentials that may be recorded on the EMG in this situation. If there are no denervation potentials, it means it is a conduction block. If denervation potentials are seen, it is an avulsion injury. Motor nerve conduction values in the infant also differ from values in the adult. For example, median and ulnar nerve conduction velocities average 27 meters per second in the newborn and this is half the adult average. Adult values are reached at about 4 years of age. It is interesting to note that the median nerve conduction velocity tends to lag behind the ulnar nerve velocity and even the peroneal nerve motor velocities. On motor nerve stimulation, the motor unit action potentials are recorded and evaluated by assessing the amplitude, the phases and the duration. Even here, the quality and quantity of the motor unit action potentials in infants and children is not the same as those of adults. Adult motor unit action potential is triphasic. In the infant, it is often biphasic. The duration in the infant is about 1 to 4 milliseconds and the amplitude and the amplitude of these action potentials in children from 0 to 3 years is around 200 to 700 millivolts. Now that we have seen a lot of detail about the electromyography and the nerve conduction studies, let us see how to correlate between the injury, the EMG and the nerve conduction study. So we shall correlate between the degree of injury and we shall be using the Susan McKinnon modification of the Sunderland classification for this, the type of recovery that can be expected, the rate of recovery and the predictability of recovery. At the same time, we shall see the fibrillation potential or the positive sharp waves which represent denervation, the motor unit potentials in the acute injury and the chronic injury. In type 1 injury which is a neuropraxia, it is favorable and fast recovery can occur in less than 12 weeks resulting in complete recovery. In these patients, there will be no denervation potentials like the fibrillation potential or the positive sharp waves and the motor unit potentials will be normal. Type 2 and type 3 represent axonotmesis. Of these, type 2 has a favorable prognosis but the rate of recovery is slow that is 1 inch per month but the recovery is complete. In this situation, the denervation potentials will be present and the motor unit potentials will be normal within 3 months. And in the long run, we will have completely normal motor unit potentials. Whereas, in the type 3 injury, the prognosis is variable and though the rate of recovery is slow, just like in type 2 injury, recovery is only partial. Denervation potentials are present and motor unit potentials are recordable only after 4 months. In the chronic situation, motor unit potentials become normal. Type 4 and type 5 that is neurotmesis in continuity or complete disruption of the nerve have an unfavorable type of prognosis with no rate of spontaneous recovery at all. The fibrillation potentials and the positive sharp waves that is the denervation potential will be present in both and no motor unit potentials are recordable in these two types of injury. Type 6 which is a mixed injury since the different types of injuries are involved in the nerves, the prognosis is also mixed and the recovery and findings is variable. After electrical stimulation of a peripheral sensory area, for example the digital nerve, somatosensory evoked potentials can be recorded over the somatosensory cortex. A normal cortical response in birth brachial plexus palsy indicates that a fair amount of sensory fibers in the brachial plexus and in the dorsal roots are conducting normally. But this recording lacks qualitative, quantitative and localization precision regarding the type and extent of the lesion. The reverse can usually be done, that is 
by stimulating over the cortex we should be able to get motor function. But pre-operative adequate evaluation of the functional integrity of the anterior cervical spinal nerve roots by motor evoked potentials in birth brachial plexus palsy is not possible. This is because of the relative lack of myelin in the central white matter in infants compared with adults. It is presumed that cortical depolarization by transcranial electrical stimulation is more difficult to achieve. So to conclude we can say that electrodiagnostic studies in patients with birth brachial plexus palsy can provide valuable clinical information in the form of location of the injury, specific segments of the brachial plexus involved, evidence of preganglionic involvement and severity of the denervation. But at the same time we need to remember that EMG gives far too optimistic an evaluation compared with the actual clinical situation. Dr. Thatte et al. believe that electrodiagnostic studies give a good estimation of the severity and extent of the injury when judiciously interpreted with clinical and intraoperative findings. As far as birth brachial plexus palsy is concerned, Having understood and learnt about the proper history taking, the clinical examination, the prognostication and the investigations, we now come to the stage perhaps the most important in the treatment of such conditions, the decision making. Should we manage conservatively or should we operate? And if we should operate, when and what should we do? This we shall see in the next video. I hope you enjoyed the video. I enjoyed making it. Please do click on the shown links to see more on the introduction to birth brachial plexus palsy and the video about the etiology of birth brachial plexus palsy. And do not forget to subscribe to stay connected with the latest in learning hand surgery, trauma surgery, plastic surgery and ethics. Manakkam.